Now I know that I had a drinking problem. Okay. And I'm 52 years old. Come on now. And I've been bound up in all of that until almost two years ago when I went to the mission. Yeah. And, and it was a process for me. I I was raised up in church, mm -hmm. but I wasn't listening to what they were saying. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to hear, but it's another thing to listen and understand what we're saying. I wasn't interested in hearing, listening. Mm -hmm. All I did was hurry. So when I went into mission and I went through that transformation program, it reintroduced me to my God. Mm -hmm. and, and then God manifests himself to the point that he started telling me to be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where did I hear that before? You know, it started bringing back. Actually, I did hear it. But I just didn't process it right then. Because by the time I got 16, I was a full-fledged alcoholic. I know this now because of this process. And then God came to me again. And I can't even say if it was a dream or if I was just sitting on my bed. Keep it real. But it was God hanging, Jesus hanging on the cross. And I seen the blood running down and I reached out and touched him. And from that point on, my life began to change. Mm -hmm. and, and, and don't get it twisted. I get problems. I mean, life shows up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But God has delivered me mm -hmm. from that sick thinking that, oh, I got to run and have a drink because so-and-so mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. I got to go hit the pipe because this happened. Mm -hmm. Like I used to, I don't have to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I constantly now seek Him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His wisdom and knowledge and the will for him for me. Mm -hmm. and, and I know now that each day that I, I come, get up out and come out of that room, when I help somebody else, mm -hmm. it might just be a hello. Mm -hmm. I'm doing his will. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to keep going and, and pursuing him the way I, I should have been a long time. The way my parents and grandparents raised me to. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going back doing what they already had told me what I needed to do. Now, now, see, you bring up what I what I was saying earlier is there's a born again experience. We not we may not uh, uh, name it, a couch it as such, but until you get serious with this program, you have to have trans. There has to be a transformation of the mind where you've actually uh, uh, been able to see in, in hindsight that you've blown off so many years of your life. Now, like you said, you know, in high school, I was an alcoholic. I mean, I, I was drinking beers, uh, leaving high school, going and get a, a quart of beer, and drinking wine. This was in high school. Are you following what I'm saying? And then might as well be smoking a joint, which costs a quarter, in junior high school. Are, are you following what I'm saying? And this was a daily occurrence up till high school. By high school, I was just a full-fledged alcoholic and did not know it. So by the time I I, uh, I look back from 76 to uh, I got sober in uh, 1986, which was 10 years, are you following what I'm saying? I had blown as if a person had been in the penitentiary for 10 years. I, it was a shocker to me that I had blown off 10 years. But I was it, it was so shocking to me that I said, you know what, I, I, I'm dead to that. That's not even me. And so when I say I was born again, that's when life took on a whole new meaning for me. Are you following what I'm saying? And I think that's why we can relate to whether a guy's been in a, in a joint for five years or 10 years. Everybody in terms of uh, uh, embracing, before you can seriously embrace this, this program of recovery and reentry, and it is reentry, make no mistake about it. You have to be born again. I mean, you have to have a shocking, uh, 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 what, what is the word I want to look for? You, you have to have uh, uh, a realization, uh, an epiphany. You have to have a realization that you've just blown a great substantial portion of your time. And then at that point, you're really looking for some power, and we find out that we, we, aren't, we are powerless in terms of this substance battle that we've been into, but there's power available, and we learn that. That uh, as we as we say is uh, the serenity prayer, which is what we want to say now. We know that it's really serious, and in saying that, now is a good time to say it. God, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. And it's it's a beautiful thing, you know. Once we uh, get a taste of the fact that God is good, and that He's available and He's good all the time. That's, that's uh, 
a totally different, uh, that's, that's a brand new concept to us. Because he was always there ready for us. But as you said, we, we can look back on it, and I can go back when I was a child too, you know. We can look back on it and see the guy was always there, but we was always going in the opposite direction. I, I catch you a little bit later. I'll be back a little bit later. Well, now that we're about to enter into terms of uh, step number seven, asking him to remove our shortcomings. Having done step number six, what we say is uh, we ask God that we were entirely ready. In other words, the, the opposite of being entirely ready means we, we are entirely fed up with where we came from. You see what I'm saying? There's a flip side of that. We said we are entirely ready to have God remove all, everything that we was fed up with, everything that held us back, everything that we held dear to us that drained the, and sucked the life out of us for how many years that it done it, that it, that it had, uh, did, had done that in terms of sucking the life out of us. Uh, we are ready. We are entirely ready to have God remove all those defects and characters. And at that point, uh, we say step number six is is the is is at the point. It's the step where the deepest work is done. That's when we really start to lean on God. Now we're into step number seven, and that step number seven is where we're going to talk a little bit more about God. And we do step number seven, as they say, on our knees. So let's look at step number seven. And, you know, a lot of us would like, uh, you know, individually, we would like for people to see the light. But until you really see, until that light really goes on and you really realize that life is for the living and, and, it's, and you can live life on a, uh, a better quality of life and all you have to do is accept that power until a person makes up that mind and makes up his mind that he's sick and tired of being sick and tired. There's very little that you can do to allow that person to, to be born again into a new lifestyle and a relationship with God. And I tell you, my sponsor told me this, and I'll never forget it. We may try and, and wish it on people, but here's what he told me. He said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And man, that's the, when he said that, it's, in other words, you can talk to a brother till he blew in his face. The younger brothers, but until they get ready for it, man, their mind is not going to be changed. Exactly, because it didn't work for me. I tried. I did it for my mother, my grandmother. Uh, everybody prayed. We praying for you. You need to do it. But until I got tired, mm -hmm. it wasn't on her. I mean, and I've been in programs before, and that's why it didn't work. Because I wasn't ready. I didn't right. do it for me. Right. And you're right. You're absolutely right. Until I got ready to do it for myself, when I got tired, that's only now that this, this process is working for me. My brother, you can you can you see can you reflect on a time when that light went off, where you said, you know what, this this is, uh, I'm, I'm dead to this. I'm I'm going to be I'm born again. My life is is much more than what I've allowed myself to to uh, to be trapped by uh, up to this particular point. I'm no longer going to be victimized by that substance abuse or drug abuse type activity and lifestyle. Can you remember when that occurred? Yeah, it, it occurred. When I got clean six years ago, and how it happened is just like he was saying about how you have that experience with God, that, that, that real, true, honest gut feeling. Because, I mean, it's like when I surrendered to you, I honestly, honestly surrendered, but I didn't surrender just because of the situation. I surrendered because my spirit was dead, my emotions was dead. I didn't surrender because I ran out of money, I didn't surrender because I ran out of drugs. I surrendered because I was just spiritually, my spirit was dead. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was dead, but also at the same time I knew it was dead, God said, you're not dead. Come on now. Because when I walked, when I, when I, my last bout, when I walked away, I gave away over $200 worth of drugs. Handed to somebody. Not, and see, not worried about, I was giving something away. But for some reason, it's, I, was, I was compelled, I was done. Wow. And, I, and, I, and I, that's, how, that's why I said it wasn't because I didn't have, I ran out of something. It's because I was spiritually dead. Mm -hmm. And some, and just like God was just telling me, get up and walk away. This, this, is, this is not you. Mm -hmm. And leave everything else and just leave it behind you. And that's just how it was. I left it. Didn't worry about where it was going. Gave it away and just got it. And I walked to treatment. Mm -hmm. It was freezing cold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At that point, yeah, I did know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did know. I didn't forget what was behind me, but I left it behind me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going, but I left it behind me. Don't worry about going back and trying to pick it back up or worry about that situation. I, I just, it wasn't in me no more. And then not only that, it was weird because I've heard people share this too. 
Like, I, I couldn't even get high no more. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm sitting there trying to, trying to, mm. I'm going ham, and, not, and nothing's happening. That's how I knew, too. Nothing's happening. Mm. I'm like, what's going on? You know, and I'm, while I'm sitting there, just like he said, I can hear this voice. I can hear this voice talking to me. Come on now. And my conscience telling me, and it was God. I knew it. I didn't know no mistake. I knew it was. I was the only one in the room. Wow. So at that point, yeah, I truly knew. Hey, just, so, so the first thing, you remember that paper that I read to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. When you sit over there and you, yeah, exactly. yeah. And, That's and when I you wrote that? Part. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Wow. wow, yes, yeah. I remember yeah. that. Like it was yesterday. Yeah. yeah. That's wow. when I wrote that. Mm. I was done. I was truly done. Wow. You know, you just brought something to my memory because leading up to me coming into the mission, <laughs> I, I suffer from bipolar, so um, I was in the depression. I was thinking about my mother, who died in 2006. My sister had just went to the penitentiary. She was pregnant, a baby on the way, you know. And I just, I said, you know what? I ain't had to deal with this. And my sick man told me, kill yourself. So I stopped taking my insulin, stopped taking all my medication, and and one day's time, I smoked $1,200 worth of dope and couldn't get hot. I was trying to bust my heart. That, I, yeah, I, That's I, I, what I was, I was trying to do. I think I was too. Like, the girl listen. downstairs came up and knocked on the door, and I wouldn't answer. And she turned the door, and I hadn't locked the door. And she looked at me and seen all that stuff over the table. And she said, Amen. come downstairs with wow. me. And she called my stepfather. And I went to the psych unit at Union World Hospital, and that's when I admitted to them that I was trying to kill myself. I knew about the program, but at that point, I was so low in my, in my spirit mm -hmm. that all I see was death. Mm -hmm. But when I got to the mission, that's when God told me, you don't belong to you, you belong to me. Wow, yeah. You know, it's not your choice. And I began to understand, he started talk, telling me, you got a purpose. And I started thinking about it. when I was 18, I wanted to be a doctor. When I was 25, I wanted to be a chef. That's the only thing that I did is went to culinary school. After that, I had other dreams and aspirations and goals, but I started smoking crack and, 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 it, and it just went away. All I, all I could see was the dope man and the, and the crack. I even stopped drinking alcohol when I got introduced to crack. That was the last time I took a drink. But you know what, and, and we're describing that born again experience. And it happens at various times in our lives. And as you said, we, we are not uh, our own. We are, uh, we are God's. We're children of God. And when we realize that and join that born again experience, that epiphany and it kicks in, we do have a, 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 a father that is the most high. Are you following what I'm saying? And, we said, and here's what he says. He says, and I want to say in Romans, uh, in, I think it's like 5 and 8. He says, while we were yet sinners, it, while we was trying as hard as we could to get high, he commended his love toward us. Are you, and at some point, we were, we were able to receive that love. We, we, at some point, when we were doing what we were doing, you said, well, you know, love is available. And then he says, not only was love available, Christ died for us. And it was paid all across that what we did. And then we click in and say, you know, I do have a purpose. God does have a plan. And we can, we can think about those ambitions and hopes and goals and and, and, and that we that we pursued and and actually uh, 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 finished finished that uh, whole endeavor and, and was successful. However, something got in the way, and so what we say is we learned that there is love because obviously it must have been there when we were pursuing some of those 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 goals and and that we successfully achieved. Are you following what I'm saying? It's it's amazing what, what love can do. So Tina Turner says, "What love got to do with it?" God says, "It's got everything to do with it." You, are you bothering what I'm saying? And at that point, when we realize that we are, not only that he loves us, but we are lovable, when we realize that we are lovable, it changes our whole perspective. And then when we understand where the love comes from, you said something powerful. It had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with relationship. It was that one-on-one -on -one love that you knew that was there for you and you had to pursue it. It was made obvious and apparent to you right. that life has more to offer than what you were uh, uh, involved in and, and that you were loved. And you went after it. And here we are, all of us, at whatever point that we saw it, it was real. We went after it, each and every one of us. And with testimonies of that, of and God's love. Else, 
through his love, he's taught me I'm learning to love myself. Come on now, yeah. yeah. You know, through his love, mm -hmm. I'm learning to love myself because I, I didn't know how to love myself. Because mm -hmm. if I did, I wouldn't have been doing what I was doing. I was Man. killing myself. So, so you know, when we look back on where, where he's brought us from, he brought us from a mighty long way, man. Mighty. Yeah. So let's look at step number seven. Now, step number seven is where we do the fine tuning. And we, we, we've, all, we've all been humbled by our experiences. Ain't no shame in our game. We ain't holding nothing back. All of us know something brought us here, something led us here. So let's look at step number seven. The step in and of itself says what? Humbly ask him, and we know who him is, to remove our shortcomings. Even though we made it up to this particular point, uh, having made it up to step number six, six, seven, there are still some things that we know we need to work on. And so we know that we can trust God and he's reliable and dependable to take care of those little things. And you have to, we can't shoot for perfection. God is perfection. But there are some small things that we have to leave up to him and he will deal with them. Now let's look at the power passages. And I like to call it the power passage because it gives us power to carry out the step. Where do we get our fuel and our power from? From the relationship with God. And so here's the power passages that allows us to carry out and to comprehend uh, at, with clarity uh, and with, 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 with uh, a better understanding what step number six is asking. It says, if we confess our sins, who? He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, I like this term. I always say I like this term purify. Because here's what it is, and purifying goes hand in hand with the shortcoming. Has anybody ever saw, uh, or, or on television or otherwise, saw a person that sells water purification systems? Mm -hmm. They have this like litmus test, you know, and they can sell you on this, man. This thing, th that water look good. He said, taste your water. And that water, your water be like, hmm, it tastes okay with me. I don't know what I, then he put his little, his little stick in there and it changes different colors. Or he may put a little peel in there and if, it, right. if it's got certain chemicals in it, it might turn murky pink. Or then it might turn green. Or then it might turn black. And you're like, when, after he put that stick in there, you see it, the, the color uh, uh, graduate to a, to a horrible dark color. You man, you say, I mean, I've been drinking this all along. I thought the water was okay. Are you following what I'm saying? And so, so are we in terms of recovery. We think that we're okay, but God purifies us. Are you following what I'm saying? There's When we get into this born-again relationship with him, there are some things, honestly, that we know that's just not right and pure. As a matter of fact, it's downright dirty. Some small things, some particulates like you have in water. Are you following what I'm saying? You're a chef. You know how you have certain uh, particulates, you know, ingredients that you can't see to the naked eye. Are you following what I'm saying? But nevertheless, they're, they're, they're injurious or they're, 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 they're uh, 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 they're, they're, they're dangerous to you, you know what I'm saying? They, they, they don't allow the flavor to come through as it would in terms of your food unless you get these particular, and a good chef can taste it. You need a little less of this, a little more. So what I'm saying in terms of purifying, I like that term. We may think we're okay and clean, but there are some things in us that makes us unpure. And the only way that we're going to get that is humbly, uh, as we say, ask him to remove our shortcomings. And here it is, if we confess these impurities, which we call sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us. Get those little things out of there, those particulars, those little things that, that we notice there. Maybe the other person can't see it, right. but because we're in a relationship with God, we can see that there's some particulars that need to be purified of all unrighteousness. Now, let's, let's look at understanding step number seven right beneath it. It says, if anyone who has been seriously ill or injured knows what it's like to need others, it is indeed humbling when we are in, when we are in that sick bed and unable to move or care for ourselves, even the simplest needs must be met by another. Simplest as well as shortcoming. Make that connection. Simplest needs must be met by another. By the time we come to step number seven, we realize that we are on, are on a sick bed. And the only one who can meet the needs, it, meet our needs is God. Every step up until now has reinforced the same thing. We are unable but God is able. So now, as we lie helpless and humbled on our sickbed of our disease, we pray, remove, uh, remove my shortcomings. Are you following what I'm saying? So now what we're doing is we've, we've, even, we've come to the point where we, we actually realize that prayer, there's power in prayer. Right. 
because there's no way we made it up to this point having not prayed. Are you following what I'm saying? And most of our prayers have actually been answered in terms of turning us away from the sick bed of activities that we've been involved in. Are you following what I'm saying? I like this part. Of, we'll go down a little bit further, but I like this part where they said is uh, there's some issues in terms of that 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 are uh, we, we can identify them as being on our sick bed that we that we need to, to get. Uh, healed for and uh, healed of and God God gives us the ability to get healed. Now let's look at working step number seven. Step seven requires prayer. We're gonna see that come up quite a bit. This step is on our knees. Our condition, our, our condition, our honesty, and our pain have humbled us. So now we must open our mouths and pray. Temptation here is to pray, or the temptation here is to pray a general prayer. Uh, we are tempted to ask God to remove everything as if it was a package deal. But that's not how the program works. If we were uh, thorough, uh, our step four inventory list, and, and we remember what step four is, made a session of fearless more inventory. Uh, this list, each character defect, we, we said listed each character defect separately. Our confession in step five, admitted to God to ourselves and another human being, the exact nature of our wrong. Step five was also done item by item. And later our amends will be made individually. So now in step seven, uh, our step seven work is humble prayer for the removal of our shortcomings. One defect at a time, individually. One at a time specifically. Okay, now prepare for step number seven. We prepare for step number seven by holding nothing back from God. No glimmer of hope in our own ability to control. We prepare for step number seven by making sure that we have overcome the fear of letting go of our defects. We prepare for step seven by learning to draw near to God by becoming comfortable in God's presence. And then, of course, we have the prayer in terms of step number seven too. My creator, I am willing that you should have all of me, uh, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defective character that stands in the way of my, uh, my usefulness to you. As my brother said, I have a purpose. My usefulness to you and my fellows. Remember what you said every day when you get up? And my fellows. We're no, we're no longer selfish. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do what? Your bidding. Now, I want to share something with you in terms of that. I think it's in Luke numbers. We'll do Luke, uh, Luke 12. In terms of the power of prayer, and I want your opinion on this, and I think it's pretty, pretty evident why we need prayer. And as a matter of fact, God, God actually uh, uh, tells us how to pray. Now listen to this. Listen to what He says, and I'm just going to go. I think what I'll do is, uh, I want to go from. Okay, uh, let's do this. Uh, okay, here it is. I'm going to read the beginning of it. Luke number 12. In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon, upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Be ye, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, we're talking about parents being hypocritical. Now, listen to this. For there is nothing uh, covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, here it is, whatever, uh, whatever, whatsoever ye have spoken in the darkness shall be uh, heard in the light. I want to say that this is it. This is not the one that I'm going to do. I want to say it's Luke 12. Oh, Luke 11. Here we go. My fault. Here it is here, the power of prayer. No wonder I couldn't find it. Here it is right here. Uh, and I'll start at the beginning. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, and he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in as an, uh, heaven as in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive others, as we forgive everyone that is uh, 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 that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil and he said unto them here's what here's here's the point that I want to make the power of prayer he said unto them which of ye shall have a friend and shall go unto him 
at uh, midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. Now check out how God is right here. Let me go to verse number six. For a friend of mine is in his journey, is come, is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, this is what you'll do for a friend. Trouble me not, nor is not, nor is now, uh, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, here's my point, though he will not rise and give him because he is a friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Now here's what he says. Uh, in other words, if a friend would give you whatever you need in a time of need, God would do just as much. But here's, here's a bigger point. And I say unto you, here it is right here, verse 9. And it shall be given you, he says, I say unto you, ask when you're praying. Here it is my point. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. For everyone that asketh receiveth. Okay? And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be open. If a son, if a son shall ask a bread of any of you that is that is a father, will ye give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him serpent? Or if he shall ask for a Will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, then be being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask for him? Now here's my point in terms of doing all this. He says there's three levels. He says if you ask, and then he says if you knock, and the other one is seek. You see what I'm saying? So it, it may not just come in your own hands. Are you following what I'm saying? You, you may ask it, but you got to put some, put some action behind it. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? And you have to knock. You follow it on that door. You got to get to that door where there are some things that are required of you. Prayer doesn't guarantee that you're going to get it. Are you following what I'm saying? There are some things that we have to do that's connected to prayer. But he says, on your best day, what men have done to you, I can even do better. Are you following what I'm saying? On your best day, if you're a father and you give it, how many of us would do almost anything for our kids? Up to including, even no matter how angry you are to them, if their life were in danger, tell me you would not step in the middle of it and intervene. And I, I don't even know how to explain that. It's just something about that fatherly thing that kicks in. And I'll show you how strong that, fa that fatherly uh, 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 instinct is that'll kick in. If your next door neighbor house is burning and you see a child in there, you would, you would nine times out of ten go in that house at the risk of your life. That's that fatherly instinct. Are you following what I'm saying? You wouldn't think, most of us wouldn't think twice about it. The danger wouldn't even, wouldn't even uh, register in. Are you following what I'm saying? Somebody's life in danger, you're going in. Well, how many of us can see that God saw our lives was in danger? He sent that lady down there to your apartment. Yeah. Are you following what I'm saying? With, with you, you follow me. He gave you that poem. You know what I'm saying? To say you come up out of this situation. You know, I'm here. I've been here. You know, he's always, no matter what we do, in terms of that father instincts, he, I like the way he connects that. Are you following what I'm saying? What we would do for our kids, well, what he would do even more for us. Are you following? Can, can we all give it some, uh, can reflect back on some instances where we can see where that is so true? Prayer is powerful. It, it is absolutely powerful. And so that's where we at. The, those little things that we're dealing with, how many of us know? I think they said Paul had a thorn in his side. He always wanted to get that thorn out. And, 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 and God said, I'm going to leave that there so to remind you that you need me. Are you following what I'm saying? How many of us in here can, can actually say, we pretty much, oh, you know what? I forgot to pass that. Give me for a pass. I got it. I got it. Thank you. I'm talking about I'm talking about Hey, but you know what I'm saying? How many of us can say that there's, there's a little thorn in your side, that there's something in your side that's just nagging you? And man, no matter how much you try, it just seems like it ain't. But, but some big stuff done been moved out of your way. But there's some smart. You can you identify with that, my brother? Yeah, oh, no, I'm just. Uh, Can't you identify with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it's always something that you know, like Paul said. Paul said, 
even though I, I, I will to do right, I, I'm finally doing wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to be good, mm -hmm. but something's stopping me, and I, I can't live up, live to that whole spiritual thing I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. But as long as I'm, I know I'm, I'm one of Christ's disciples and I'm walking in Christ, I'll be all right. Mm -hmm. you know, as long as I keep spreading the word. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think his exact word, but... You know, that's the essence of it. That was the essence of it, for sure. That was definitely the essence of it. And so as we, but, but what he wants us to do as well is to look how, how many things have actually been moved, been removed. Things that we've tried desperately to get our, you know, to, to get rid of or, or shake free from or, or to get loose from. And today is the third, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the point of it is, is that for, at this particular point, it's not the big. It's not the big things that are that really uh, has us uh, uh, so much concern. It's that little thing that we just can't seem to, to shake. And what he says is, is uh, you know, I, I, I can I can help you get rid of this thing, but you're gonna have to pray about it seriously and uh, seek him, uh, pray as as well as as knock on that door. You know. You know what I'm coming to understand is a, a, a phrase that we use in AA. And yes. faith without works is dead. There it is. And it's the same thing God is telling us. You just not gonna receive something. You gotta do something in order to receive something. Mm -hmm. You yep. know, and, and it just constantly reminds me the mm -hmm. faith without works is dead. I can have all the faith in the world I want to mm -hmm. that I'm gonna get a job. But if I don't get out there and I put an application in, I'm not gonna get no job because they don't know who I am. Right. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's. It's, it's a constant day-to-day -day thing. You have to constantly work on your faith, <coughs> your belief, whatever you try to do. It just can't gonna fall out the sky. Mm -hmm. You gotta put some work in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and now I like this part about and uh, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings because uh, what he says is everything that I've done up to now. There's still some things that and we talked about that purity. Uh, 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 Perspective. There's still a few things that I need uh, worked uh, uh, worked out in my life that I, I just can't do it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And understanding by understanding the the, the, the uh, how we've been blessed and how those other obstacles can move moved out our lives out of our lives. Rather, now we actually are convinced that praying works, and we actually get down on our knees and ask God to remove those things. And uh, and He will do it, as I read in uh, Luke uh, chapter 11. Anyone wants to add to that? Let's move on a little bit further then. Get, get this? Okay, yeah. Let's go a little bit further in terms of the prayer aspect. And when you have chance, you can read that Luke chapter 11. And there's there's several examples that he gives. Luke 11 is so is, is so powerful. There are several examples that he gives. How he goes above and beyond any anything any human being can do in terms of meeting your needs. And uh, I didn't have time to read the whole... And I kind of botched it up a little bit, but Luke 11 is very powerful if you read it all the way through. Where was you at, Ralph? Uh, uh, we are on step number seven, and on page 117. And then as we go a little bit further, humbly, uh, this humility, expanding on the, on the humility aspect, humbly asking them to remove our shortcomings. Let's look at page 117. Uh, humility is a recurring theme in the 12-step program, and the central ideal of step number seven. By practicing humility, we receive the grace necessary to work the program and achieve satisfaction results. That's what we're about results. We recognize now that most of our lives have been uh, devoted to fulfilling our self-centered desires. We must set aside these prideful, less than nurturing behaviors, come to terms with our inadequacies, and realize that, that humbly seeking God's will along will free, uh, free our spirit. Step seven requires surrendering our will to God and uh, to God so that we may receive the serenity necessary to achieve the happiness we see. Okay, having dealt with that humility aspect, let's go a little bit further. We are growing in wisdom and knowledge of Christ. This growth not only comes because we are seeking it, but also from the insight gained by examining the pain of our past struggles. As my brother said, we look back on it, but we don't live back there. <clears throat> Moving on a little bit further, we gain courage by hearing how others cope with their life challenges. As we work the steps, we recognize the value of not acknowledging the truth of our past. Although 
The pain of this reality may seem unbearable. The insights we achieve are the only means to our release. So we got to look back there to some extent. We ain't got to live there. Moving on a little bit further, step six prepared us to let go of our old defective behaviors and freed us to develop the power, powerful new ones that God intended for us to use. And we know uh, step six was we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of characters. Moving a little bit further, says asking God to remove our faults is a true measure of our willingness to surrender control. For those of us who have spent our lives thinking we were self-sufficient, the surrender of control can be extreme an, an extremely difficult task. Are we sincerely ready to abandon these deceptions? If so, then we can ask God to help us let go of our past and nurture the new life within us. Step seven is the is the vitality is vitally important part is is a vitally important part of the cleansing process. Remember we were talking about purifying in that a power passage. It says he calls it here a cleansing process and prepares us for the next stage of our journey. During the first six steps, we became aware of our problems, looked at our look at our lives honestly, revealed previously hidden aspects of our life, and became ready to change our attitudes and behavior. Step seven present, presents us with an opportunity to turn to God and ask for removal of those parts of our character that caused us, there's that word again, pain. This is what we want to get rid of and healed of on our sick beds we talked about. Moving on a little bit further, before the beginning of this program, we avoided looking at ourselves honest, honestly and admitting the extent of our dis disabling behavior. Meditating on the vision of, of Christ's presence in our lives will focus our attention on living life according to to his example and begin to free us from the disabling burden of self. Now there's there's a new one. There's an aspect of reflecting and meditating. Are you following what I'm saying? So as we look back on our past and see that God is removing some of those disabling behaviors and some of that pain, we meditate. We don't forget. You see what I'm saying? We continue to reflect on that, but we're moving toward being a wholeness that we have in Christ. Are you following what I'm saying? And, and it helps us reinforce our praying. Uh, uh, our determination to pray. Let's move a little bit further. Uh, it says, our partnership with Christ will increase our concern for the whole human family. Remember how you said you want to help other people? And we, we get that when we develop that relationship with Christ, the whole human family, and put our obsession with self into proper perspective or check. We will finally recognize the person we have been, understand who we are, and look forward with joy to the person we are becoming. Preparing to have our shortcomings removed requires willingness to work with God. Remember you said, just, we hit all of them right on the head. Prayer without works is dead. We've got to put some work in there. We can want a job all we want to. We don't, we don't put no work behind it. So it says willingness to work with who? With God to revise and redirect our attention actively. Our progress will be harder if we continue our destructive behaviors. We must be ever vigilant and alert to the possible return of old behaviors and work diligently toward eliminating them from our lives. It is wise to be gentle with ourselves and remember that it took us a lifetime to develop these habits. Wow, we talked about that. It is not realistic to expect them to disappear overnight. When looking, finally here, when looking to God to remove our shortcomings, we do well to remember. We talked about that thorn in our side. Remember that God gives grace directly to us through prayer and meditation. And also through people. God often uses outside forces to correct our defects. Ministers, teachers, medical doctors, therapists can all be instruments of God's grace. Our willingness to seek, out, seek, seek outside help can be a clear indication of our readiness, willingness and readiness to change. Compulsive worries can, compulsive worriers can pray to God to release their worries and at the same time seek help from a counselor or relief or relieve their, to relieve their anxieties. Person who overindulge in food or drugs. So this is beyond just drugs and not drugs. It says food and drugs, and we're talking about sex as well, can seek professional help to gain control over their obsessive habits. We need to pray for God's help in removing our shortcomings and have the courage to seek appropriate professional help when we need to. And so as we say it's here, and, 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 it, and it actually, and we actually talked about that, and I, I want to hit that one more time. 
in terms of that, uh, in, in terms of the necessity to pray. And for the men that weren't here, uh, what I did was I, I read Luke chapter 11, and it says here, uh, verse number uh, 10, it says, uh, no, 9, it says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you seat, and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be open. So, you know, I mean, there, there, that in the, in above itself, I mean, it, it really says it all. You know, first of all, you got to pray. It's just ask and seek, you know, and knock. There's some things that you're going to have to do. You just can't sit there and expect sobriety to come to you or for your life to turn around. You got to put, you got to put this thing into action. And you got to understand that uh, he, he is this, God's desire is to answer uh, your prayers, you know. And so, uh, how many of us can actually say at this particular time that 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 they uh, come to believe that that prayer works, or that they're, they're convinced that some that that prayer has been the agent of opening up doors and creating opportunities and and protecting you from things that otherwise you wouldn't uh, wouldn't have uh, uh, been able to uh, uh, things these things wouldn't happen wouldn't wouldn't have been able to happen in your life had you not engaged in the activity of prayer. I, um, just like you said in the book, you know, God put people in, it, in your path, uh -huh. and he's uh, put a person in my path in the form of a minister. <laughs> then my minister put me in the path of the men's ministry <laughs> in my church, <laughs> then the choir, and, and now deaconship. I mean, it's, it's a process, and every time I, when I, I read this, when you were reading it, it just showed me exactly what it said right here is the process that I'm going through right now. <laughs> and, and, I mean, and, and some of it I didn't ask for. You know, but I'm beginning to understand, you know, uh, sometimes people see things in you that you wow. don't see in yourself. You took that right out. I was just going <laughs> to. And so I, I'm learning to accept these Come on, things. Guys. And, and, and it's all about being a servant. Right. You know, so uh, I'm willing to do the work that I need to do because that goes back to me seeking him diligently. You know, and I ain't perfect at it. <laughs> you know, but, you know, if I keep going at the rate I'm going, I'll never, I, I, I'm not going to be perfect at it, but I, I'll get better at it. Mm -hmm. uh, let me, let, I just want to say this. Uh, Come on, I It stuck out when you said, I didn't ask for this. You mm -hmm. asked for it. But when we pray, we uh -huh. say, God, help us. Let your will be done, not mine. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to use you. You ain't going to use him. Right. You know, so Good. when you ask for help and he get to use it up, you know, he's going to use us in his way, not our way. You know, he'll tell us all the time, you know, my thoughts and your thoughts and ways and your, your way. So when we ask for help, what are we asking for? We're asking for his help. Come on, huh? You don't want my help, though. I'm going to say, come on, with money you got, we can go around here. I can fix it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when you ask for his help, you know, his help going to come. You don't know how, like you just admitted. You know, we don't know who he's going to put in our path or how he's going to do it. Like you, you said, you tell people just by saying, good morning. You don't know, and you do, you really help me, because when you're at the dance, and you, well, you know, your music going, you know, I go down and elevate and sing in that song, whatever you play. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, 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 okay. right, that's a good <laughs> and point. And I just left my room and said my prayer, and there you hit, you got a song, a gospel song going. And when I hit, you know what I'm saying, I hear that song going out the door, you know, I'm on my way. So when you ask for help, who, who help are you asking for? Your own, you his. There you go. So you ask for it. And it's amazing how he put people in our lives, as you said. And it's it's it, that's just so true. Yeah. And they can see things in you that you can't see. You know, and sometimes they can see it before you can. But what they'll do is they'll wait it out and say, you know, I'm just yeah. gonna wait and see. <laughs> is yeah. Gonna continue moving in this right. direction. But a lot of people can see it before, long before you see it. Man, I knew you was gonna move down this direction. You know, yeah. I knew it. And, and I think you're ready for this. You see what I'm saying? You be like, well, no, maybe I ain't. I mean, even when I wrote my book, I had no idea that I would write a book, you know. I never knew that, that, that I enjoyed writing and, and communicating and, 
and 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 just expressing my thoughts and putting them down on paper. I never knew that, but I have a friend that saw that in me, you know. And it's it's amazing what people can see. You know, whether you go to a, um, a third, even coming to these groups, you'd be amazed what you yeah. what you get out of these groups. What somebody might say yeah. that'll uh, encourage you. And, and God put them there for a reason. It's the same way when we was out there in the streets. You know, people see you doing things. All right, boy, you're going to get wow. your head busted. Yeah. You know, and I did. Mm -hmm. Boy, you going to penitentiary. And I did. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm just saying. People that, see and it goes, that way, too. It goes you know, that way, too. It goes that way, too. You keep that out. Somebody's going to bust your head. <laughs> you know. Can't add no more to but that. But see, we be so caught up. Well, yeah, well, we, don't see. we don't see it. We think we slick.